Cal Varian. I'm the chief economist here at Google. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Richard Thaler. Uh, he was awarded the 2017 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his contributions to the field of behavior economics. In fact, I would say he's almost the inventor of uh, behavior economics. He and a small group of, uh, of, uh, of, of friends and colleagues. Uh, he's currently the Charles Walgreen Distinguished Professor in Behavioral Sciences and Economics, University of Chicago, Booth School of Business, member of the National Academy of Sciences, American Academy of Arts and Science. And in 2015, he was president of the American Academy of, uh, sorry, president of the American Economic Association. He's been published in numerous prominent journals and is the author of Misbehaving, the Making of Behavior Economics. And uh, before I leave the stage, I want to tell you a very brief story about something that, uh, uh, where I first met, first got involved with Richard, and that was in, uh, uh, the uh, 1986 or thereabouts, when we were creating a new journal for the American Economics Association, we were thinking about what should go in that journal. And uh, I said, why don't we have a section on anomalies, things that don't fit into the standard models we use in economics. And everybody thought this was a great idea, but they said, well, where can we find a person like that? And I said, I've got just a guy for you. So Richard, Take it from there. Well, that's true. Ever since then, Hal has been periodically claiming that he invented me. <laughs> um, but the, that, that series of anomalies uh, well, turned out to be important uh, <clears throat> because they were widely read. And um, there was a survey done, something like half of the members of the association claimed to be reading them regularly and a typical journal article might get a few hundred readers if it's really popular so uh, uh, i i'm not sure you invented me hal but uh i owe you a debt <laughs> okay so i think uh you're on now so please uh Let's hear your your current views on behavior economics and the challenges it faces. Wow, um, you know I think we're we've reached a stage where behavioral economics it's it kind of a stage I was hoping to reach where behavioral economics is part of the repertoire. So it used to be if you were a behavioral economist, you are a professional troublemaker. And um, and it was a small group of troublemakers. Now, lots of economists consider a behavioral approach just part of their toolkit. And um, I, I think the biggest challenges are to apply principles to fields where it hasn't become commonplace. Uh, I think one one area where it started, but there's a lot of work to do is macro. So if, if you think about, say, what the, the questions that the Fed is dealing with now about inflationary expectations, that is essentially a behavioral problem. It's what do people think and why do they think it? And the, the Fed is involved in not only taking actions about buying or not buying bonds, but persuading people uh, about what's going to happen in the future. And that's an interesting behavioral problem. There is a recent macro paper that's uh, getting a lot of attention about whether inflationary expectations are worthwhile in the sense, do they really help predict actual inflation or not? So there's a technical issue there, of course, whether it's a good predictor or not, but uh, it seems to be raising uh, quite quite a bit of interest in that uh, particular area. Well, I think one thing we're, the profession isn't very clear about is whose expectations are we talking about? Right. So, I mean, you can, you can look at the yield on 
uh, inflation index bonds and back out a, an expectation of inflation of traders of those securities. But uh, if you walk down Michigan Avenue in Chicago uh, or Main Street anywhere and ask people what their expectations are about inflation over the next year, they are not likely to have a very strong opinion. They're, they're more likely to have an opinion about whether the Bears are going to win their next football game than they are about what inflation will be in 2022. Yeah. So, so wow. it, whose expectations is a big question to me. And how do they form those expectations? And this is right. very much a behavioral topic because right. one of the huge drivers is gasoline prices. Why? Because once a week you see the price of gasoline when you fill up your car and that's going to be a big uh, driver of things that are frequently purchased of uh, that sort. So here's an interesting thing. When we're all driving EVs, how will inflation expectations change? Huh. Because when you plug in, you don't see $80 or whatever. Well, it wouldn't be anyway, but in, it, it, you, you don't see a price. And yeah. you're, you're right that gasoline prices are probably the most salient price to most people. Yeah. And then there are some grocery store items like milk and bread, uh, but everything else, people don't really know or see. They've got a uh, inflation index called the sticky price index. And what that does is it focuses on uh, goods that rarely change prices. So we're seeing there's something anomalous to use the term here. Uh, there's something anomalous going on in terms of uh, prices that usually are pretty stable are now going up. What does that mean? So. Yeah, and you know, one thing I've been thinking about recently, so we, we've we talked about sticky wages in economics going back to Keynes. So in the Great Depression, there was a, a question, how can it be that a third of the workforce is unemployed? Why don't wages fall to clear the market? And the sort of tautological answer was, well, wages are sticky meaning they don't fall enough to clear the market. It's not an explanation. Um, but I think there's a question now whether wages are sticky upwards. Mm -hmm. Because we hear about sh labor shortages in all kinds of domains. Every restaurant you go into has a help wanted sign. And um, there are all these supply chain problems, some of which are because they can't get enough truck drivers or something. And my question is, are wage setters too reluctant to raise wages for reasons that I, I don't know, but I suspect that there is some of that. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're seeing it. And of course, what happens is when you raise the wages to attract new hires, you pretty much have to raise the wages for the existing employees as well. Uh, if you don't, you run into a lot of uh, problems, again, of a behavioral nature, so that uh, you get- Although you could wages. have signing bonuses and yeah. retention bonuses. So this is what we call a framing, right? So if you give every new employee two grand and every existing employee two grand to stick around through next year, maybe you don't have to be as clear about what permanent wages are going to be. I don't right, know. it's a lot, and, and they do that in the trucking industry, for example, that you're getting a wage, but then once you complete a certain number of uh, trips, then you get a, a bonus uh, on top yeah. of that wage. So, so in the book, I read the book. Maybe I, I have to. We start. should mention what book this is, Al. Excellent. Why don't Why don't you uh, tell us about the latest book? Well, the latest book is called Nudge, the Final Edition. And of course, Nudge is a book that Cass Sunstein and I wrote back in 2008. And you might wonder why we would rewrite a book that was continuing 
to sell lots of copies. And part of it is that the paperback contract had expired and no one had noticed. And they got around to telling us in April of 2020. And if you remember, there wasn't that much to do in April 2020. So we started tinkering. And there was a, a mention early on in the book about the spiffy iPod. Remember those? Mm -hmm. So um, when we were writing this book, we had both just bought our first smartphones. And it just struck us that the world has changed so much in the relatively short time since we had written that book. And I was bored. So uh, we ended up, uh, it, the new version is about two thirds new. We call it the final edition as a commitment strategy to make sure that we never make this mistake again. Because <laughs> it was a lot of work. Uh, uh, what I tell aspiring authors is uh, when you think you're 90% done, you're 50% done. Yeah. And all, all the dull stuff comes at the end of fiddling around with the order of things and with the index and with all that other stuff. So it's fun to write the first chapter of the book, but then by the time you get to all this minutia, it's not that much fun. You know, we one of the things we wanted to do is introduce a, a concept we were talking about but had not written about, uh, which is what we call sludge. So for... Since the beginning, I've been signing copies of Nudge, Nudge for Good, which is meant as a plea. I'm sure you have a copy somewhere uh, that says, Hal, Nudge for Good. And uh, people don't always. So what is sludge? Sludge is, is the same tools, but it, it you know the idea of Nudge, the basic idea is if you want people to do something, make it easy. And lots of successful firms like Google have succeeded in large part because they make things easy. You can Google it, right? And, um, you know, it's true of Apple and Amazon and Netflix are all companies that make things easy. And, but lots of things are done that make things hard. One thing that drives me crazy is lots of services make it very easy to join and very difficult to unjoin. You can subscribe to many publications with one click and your credit card, but to unsubscribe, you have to call and go through some torture. And um, I, I don't approve of that. I've tried to convince some major publications to stop doing it, but it's obviously profitable. And so I, I think w w one of our goals was to get rid of sludge. There's a lot of inadvertent sludge, which is not, so the unsubscribe trap is intentional uh, to because it's profitable to get a, a few more months of, of your uh, payments. But a lot of sludge is just inept programming. And um, I, I think the world would be a better place if we had sludge exterminators. Um, and I, I encourage all of you Googlers who are watching this live to um, if there if you find sludge in the process, get rid of it. Well, another example of making it simple and easy to do is, of course, Google Maps. Remember what it was like planning a trip 30 oh, years ago. I, it was painful. I, I totally agree, and I think the uh, the smartphone is the single biggest 
technological advance of, I mean, and we have so many more so than the personal computer and in part because the, the computer we carry around in our pocket is more powerful than the first uh, home computer we had. And it has a map. Yes. And I have a terrible sense of direction. So I love Google Maps. And, you know, you mentioned that GPS is our ideal for a nudge. And it's because you get to pick your destination. Suppose I want to come and visit you. I plug in your address. And that was my choice. Nobody's telling me where to go. It will suggest a route. But if I see something interesting, I'm allowed to depart. And um, all of life would be great if there were a Google, Google Maps equivalent. And of course, search is like that. If I want to find out who has the record for uh, the most touchdown passes in the season, I can find that out instantly. But there are lots of things that figuring out, take our tax system. The U.S. tax system is sludge ridden. In Sweden, one files your tax return by text message. You get a text saying, according to our calculations, Hal, we owe you 10,000 kroners. If you agree, press one and the money appears in your account. And if you think of 89% of American taxpayers would be eligible for such a service because they take the standard deduction. And the they passed a law saying it's illegal for the IRS to send you a pre-populated tax return. That is sort of encapsules everything that is wrong with Washington and <laughs> with, and and with government. Well, and, not everything. Hmm? <laughs> I say not everything, but it's a good chunk. It, it, it's just <laughs> it, 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 I, I I I'm not saying it's the only thing wrong. It, it's uh it's just an example of some special interests and if you guess who they are, you'll be right. Uh, have got that law passed, and uh, it makes all the rest of us worse off. And there's a lot of that going on. By the way, you know who we owe the geopositioning systems to is the actually government. Ronald Reagan. Why was that? The story goes that uh, the military, of course, was a moving force to build the GPS system, right. the satellite system. And, uh, and uh, Reagan got a demo. He said, this is wonderful. Uh, can ordinary people use this tool? And they said, oh, no, no, it's all encrypted. Uh, only the military can use it. He says, we don't want that. And so then they uh, changed policy and made it available to everyone. It was little extra noise in it because they figured that consumers didn't need as quite an accurate position as the military needed but that was the uh, that was the story right and then they got rid of that you know yeah. that that's actually a good example of another theme we talk about in the book that we call smart disclosure it, there's lots of government rules about disclosures and if you think of the technology used for almost all disclosures, it's first century, right? I mean, it's it, 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 you might as well be doing it with scrolls on parchment. So putting the ingredients on a cereal package on the side of the package 
come on. Yeah. And um, that's true of almost all disclosures. And Richard, this site uses cookies. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, <laughs> even, yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the, the regulations that they passed in Europe uh, saying you have to warn about cookies. And then, so, you know, the first time you got one of those, you say, hmm, the, you, if you don't want cookies, press here. And good luck, <laughs> good luck getting out of wherever you go if you start choosing, right? So that, that's a, that was a well-intended bit of uh, regulation that nobody took the any steps to think about okay well what what else and uh, so yeah though there there are the two two of the big themes of the new version of nudge smart disclosure and sludge and they try a new form of disclosure and just create more sludge and uh, god knows we can do better so one of the impressive things about the uh, original Nudge book was it inspired uh, several governments to put together Nudge groups who would try to improve regulation and practices uh, in ways that you uh, advocated. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What, what sure. Uh, so uh, the, the, the first co uh, country to do that was the UK. And uh, the story of how that happened was um, when the, it was David Cameron, uh, Conservative Party uh, Prime Minister, and there was a young guy working for Cameron named Rohan Silva, who read an early version of Nudge and bought up, I think, the entire UK stock, which was about 10 copies, and piled them up on a prominent desk at the Conservative Party headquarters. And David Cameron picked one of them up. He was nudged and read it. And parties there have manifestos, kind of like platforms here. But unlike our platforms, they take them somewhat seriously. And it was in the Tory manifesto that if they're elected, they will do behavioral science uh, informing policy. And a week after the election, I get this phone call. Okay, we're doing this thing. Can you come over and help? And um, a guy called David Halpern was is the one who created that first unit and is still there. And uh, the White House followed suit after uh, Barack Obama got elected. And that, that unit was created by Maya Shankar, who is now a Googler. And somebody has been counting these government units and got up to 400. Really? Uh, uh, so that's governments and NGOs. And of course, there are countless equivalents in in companies like Google that are uh, so. You know, the first few, I had my fingers in the pie, but uh, um, they're out on their own now. And the you know what what are they trying to do? They're they're not trying to. It, it, let's go back to the GPS. They're, they're not trying to tell people what to do. They're trying to help people get where they want to go. So if, if you think of what's almost certainly the most successful application of behavioral economics, it's been in the redesign of defined contribution retirement plans, what, what we call 401k plans in the U.S., and there have been three big innovations that have made those a lot better. The first was 
changing the default to join, what's now called automatic enrollment. Lots of people just didn't get around to joining, even in companies that were matching contributions. So they're just throwing money away. Uh, and if you just sign up people and tell them they have to fill out a form if they don't want to join, enrollments go to 90%. Uh, almost everywhere. UK has done this at the national level and less than 10% opt out. The second is what we called save more tomorrow, which is now called uh, the generic is automatic escalation. So, so raise people's contributions gradually because they initially sign people up too low and they should be saving 10, 12%, not three. And then the third was to create good default investment strategies like these target date funds. Um, and the, that, uh, that has worked and it's why it's easy. You don't, I mean, the idea that everybody needs to become their own financial planner and figure out how much they have to save and then form the best possible portfolio uh, is a bit preposterous. There's there's a lot of interesting work to be done to help out guys our age of the, the, the second part. Okay, you've retired. How are you going to take the money that you've saved up and what are you going to do with it? That turns out to be a more difficult mathematical problem uh, than the saving up because you have to keep, you have a pretty good idea of when you may retire, but you, you don't know when you're going to die. You may know you're sick and you can spend a lot, but no one knows they're going to live to a hundred. So solving that problem is hard. And uh, that, that's one of the things that behavioral economists uh, can and should be working with. Well, this is why they have annuities, right? Annuities are one solution to that problem. That's right. But, but, solution. but it, here's what's interesting. People who are in old defined benefit pension plans, like your former colleagues at the University of California, love them. And those come with annuities. But people in defined contribution plans almost never choose to buy them. So that's an anomaly in and of itself. The, I got involved, there was a labor dispute in Chicago and the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And there was a strike. And the big issue was the management wanted to switch to a defined contribution plan. And the orchestra members didn't want it. And a friend of mine and I looked at it at the request of somebody and it looked to us like what they were being offered was better than the thing they had. But there was a guy in the union whose view was to find benefit good, to find contribution bad. And they could have lost one of the great symphonies in the world uh, on, on, on this problem and um, there were some nudges and uh, uh, fortunately there's, they're still playing. Great, fantastic. I think one of the troubles is the, the pricing is not often as attractive as one would like. And here it's a case where it looked like it was uh, better to go to defined co uh, contribution. Well, the orchestra had been, was offering a guaranteed minimum return on their investments. Yeah. which is not an offer you often get. Right. Yeah. And of course, then the question is, well, were they really be liquid enough to pay up or are they outsourcing this to a uh, insurance company or just how it's structured a lot? There's a lot of devil in the details problem. Uh, uh, yeah. That's true. So let's return to the book. Um, I noticed as I read the book, uh, this, this time there's a lot of lists in the book. 
And this is a good thing, I think, because these are sort of the items that say, well, you have to uh, look at problems with anchoring, availability, representativeness over contests, loss aversion, status quo bias, framing. And it's like you could go down the checklist. It says, well, is this policy, uh, is this showing overconfidence? Is this showing status quo bias, et cetera, et cetera? So it seems to me it's more operational than the first nudge book was. More well, a how to, how to nudge. Yeah, you know, you know, in the first book, we introduced the term choice architecture. Uh huh. And that's a term I made up. Now, it's one thing to coin a term. It's another thing to know how to do it. Right? So, yeah. you know, I coined a term, but I wasn't an architect. And uh, thanks to all these nudge units and, and lots of academics and economics and management and psychology, we've learned a lot about how how to do choice architecture better. And like we were talking about before, lots of technology firms have become very good at choice architecture. If you think, think about Amazon, they have every book in the world for sale. Now imagine going into a bookstore that had every book, like the Library of Congress or something. It would be a nightmare. You know, I want to find a copy of Hal Varian's micro book, and it might take me months to find out where it is on the shelves. It won't take long um, at, at a good website. So we've gotten a lot better at choice architecture, and it doesn't take us long to find a movie we want to watch or a route we want to go to. And so much of the reason we felt like it was worthwhile for us to rewrite this book and for people to read a new version is we've learned so much more about how to actually do stuff. Yeah. So sometime when you're bouncing around YouTube, look up the AT&T uh, commercials from 30 years ago. They ran a series of commercials about someday you'll be able to find any book in the world. Someday you'll be able to p find a movie that's uh, perfectly attuned to your taste, et cetera, et cetera. And the amazing thing is how good they were. They were really quite remarkably uh, accurate that they were able to make this forecast 30 years ago. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think you're right. usually probably. not the case. Forecasts of technology are usually hopelessly bad. Well, I think the idea of having, let's say, a portable computer or a, or a mobile phone, something like that, that was in Dick Tracy, right? In the 30s, you had the watch that you spoke into. So, right. And now right. it's now we're wearing one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. So so some of these things have, have, uh, have done very well. And when I saw my first uh, mobile phone, what impressed me the most was the fact that it had a camera with it. And think of the implications of having a camera that you're carrying with you all the time. And it's had a huge impact on all sorts of things of having that, uh, that little uh, device. Everybody knew what cameras were. Everybody used cameras, but only on special occasions. And with the mobile phones, you had it all the time, which made a huge, huge difference in all sorts of things, crime, punishment, et cetera. Right. So... Yeah, so one of the things we're very interested in at Google is how we can be helpful. In fact, that's kind of our theme these days, is being helpful in terms of the products we design, like using the uh, search, of course, but other products uh, of other sorts, the maps. The maps, I was going to say earlier when we talked about maps, uh, what's interesting is you went through all this pain and suffering to figure out your route on the map, and then you had the final insult. You had to fold the thing back up, and it never <laughs> quite worked. <laughs> you know, there's a whole generation of people listening to this that have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> These are two boomers 
who actually had to deal with folding up maps, you know. So let me ask you uh, uh, I, one topic I, uh, I wish you had mentioned. You have this astute observation, confident speakers are more likely to be correct. That's the, the uh, belief that people have, maybe unwarranted. Yeah, but I don't think we say they are more like, we say that people Oh, pe people believe there, yeah. Believe, so, right. I didn't mean to say it was your opinion. It was opinion right. of one of the common um, errors that people make. But how do you speak and convey uh, true uncertainty? Because maybe the best thing to say is, well, it depends, or maybe, maybe not, or the probability is about either either direction. Well, then it makes you look very wimpy compared to the person who says, by God, inflation is going to go through the roof uh, next quarter. Whereas really, it's a very a question that in fact, in reality, there's a lot of uncertainty around it. Yeah, so I mean, think about the abuse that Donald Rumsfeld got for this line about the known knowns and the unknown knowns. Now, he had his warts, but that was a very sensible thing to say. Yeah. And, it, you know, we economists talk about the difference between risk and uncertainty. And we're gradually learning that with COVID that there's a lot of unknown unknowns. Because every time we think we've rounded the corner, there's a new variant or a new problem. And... Uh, you know, there's a paper I like that uh, looks at the forecasts of Fortune 500 CFOs about the returns on the stock market over the next year. And they ask them for confidence limits, 80% confidence limit. So they say, give us a high forecast that will only be exceeded 10% of the time on a low forecast that will the market will only do worse than that 10 percent of the time now of course the actual number should lie between those two 80 percent of the time and and these are high, highly professional people uh the actual came in within their confidence limit one third of the time and the reason for that is, of course, their confidence limits were way too narrow. Yeah. It, now, it turns out forecasting the stock market is nearly impossible. So it's we shouldn't be criticizing them for not being able to do that. No one knows how to do that. Right. Well, I mean, this is one of the... But the, 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 the problem was that they were giving forecasts as if they could. And the, the reason I wanted to tell that story is I asked the authors, well, what would be a, a forecast, a rational range, if you knew you don't know? And it was something like up 30%, down 10%. Now, suppose... Uh, the Google CFO, Ruth, says, okay, she's at some meeting and she says, my forecast for the market next year is it'll be somewhere between up 30 and down 10. She doesn't look like she knows anything. Yeah. And, you know, suppose we go to the chief economist and we ask him and, and he gives that answer they're going to say we finally need a second chief economist. <laughs> so it's very hard to give forecasts that are as wide as they should be because it makes you look dumb. Yep. And, and that's, when that's... it comes to things like COVID and forecasting the stock market, we are dumb because we don't know what's going to happen next. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to switch to some audience questions that they've uh, asked. And um, the, 
there's a series of this five or six of them i think so here's the first one will you accept cryptocurrency as value for something you're offering like black hot tickets or corner off booth what do you think, <laughs> what do you think of cryptocurrency well i think that i'm just too old to get it yeah um and i think most economists share that view i don't and it's clear we've been wrong so far it, it's clear that cryptocurrencies are not good as currencies because they're just way too volatile right so now uh you know i i sometimes play golf with my colleague gene fama who is the leading exponent of the efficient market hypothesis people think that we must be arch enemies but uh we're actually good friends but i asked him what is more embarrassing to you bitcoin or gamestop and uh, i don't ask these sort of obnoxious questions too often here he, uh, I, i'll get and he immediately said bitcoin and th and the reason he gave is it shouldn't exist so GameStop, that he undoubtedly thinks is mispriced by a factor of 10 or 100 or possibly infinity, uh, he's heard lots of obnoxious stories from me over the years of things like that. But Bitcoin, he doesn't understand why it exists. Neither do I, but um, obviously we've been wrong in terms of what its price is and um uh so i i'm i'm not going to make any forecast about what's going to happen to cryptocurrencies well lotto exists and that leaves a room for other negative <laughs> expected value goods so it's it's amazing how popular it is yeah all right let me let me ha have another question here this actually this is a question that i put on my list as well should we teach nudging in school? Maybe starting at elementary school. Because you're trying, you know, at elementary school, you want kids to interact peaceably, you want them to do things, you want them to learn how to focus. And, and a lot of the nudges you have up here for government officials could just as well apply to kindergartners. Uh, well, you know, I don't know whether we want to call it teaching nudging, but I, I think... Uh, First of all, I think we should be teaching probability and statistics oh, yeah. some, somewhere. And I, for one, would be happy to give up trigonometry for statistics. Uh, even you, a mathematical economist, probably haven't used a cosine recently. Uh, but you have looked at a, 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 a statistics Right. So, so uh, and there are things, you know, we could certainly teach people things like um, uh, not uh, not being overconfident by having uh, kids make forecasts and see how they do. We could teach people um, to ignore sunk costs, as all economists think they should. So I think there's lots of things that would be useful to incorporate in uh, education. Uh, I have a daughter who's a middle school math teacher, and she teaches some of this stuff because she was born with it. So I'll give you an example of what you were describing. There's a book, very popular book, called Elementary Probability Using Texas Hold'em. <laughs> so all the examples of the probability, the conditional expectation, this, that, they're all they're all phrased in the in the terms of Texas Hold'em, and uh, of course that that uh, people well, like that uh, that and, uh, and thrill. I'll I'll give a plug to uh, Annie Duke has a very nice book called Thinking in Bets, and she was uh, studying psychology and had a decided to become a professional poker player instead 
And now she's back and teaching what she learned about being a poker player for uh, how to use those principles to make life decisions. And I think um, she, she is actually quite active in this space of revising the curricula um, to g teach people to be better thinkers. I think that's the right way to think about it. It's not just the math courses that should be revised, everything. The uh, the example um, of uh, of using uh, Texas Hold'em or, or games like that is, I think, very uh, compelling because people it has a certain aura to it. There are movies about poker players. In fact, now the AI challenge when these various AIs uh, compete against each other, you know, chess is dull now because it's pretty much solved. But what they're doing is they're trying to see how you can use AI in poker which is, of course, much trickier. And computer's pretty good at a poker face, right? They're not giving yeah, away. Yeah, no, that's true. But, uh, yeah, uh, getting the human element, uh, computers got very good at chess, uh, but as far as I know, are still not very good at bridge. And uh, I'm not sure exactly why bridge is harder, but I think part of it is that there's uh, more of a human element. Perhaps, perhaps, we'll see. Okay, question here. Do you see any potential nudges that could potentially help minimize the growing wealth disparity? So we thought about nudges in the context of, uh, of inequality. Um, well, I think you know, there are two parts to the wealth inequality. Uh, one is propping up the bottom, and the, the other is trimming the sales at the top. And I, I don't think that the latter is a behavioral problem. Um, that, that, uh, that's a, a tax problem. And uh, the same people who who won't let the government fill out your tax returns uh, are busy rewriting tax laws and uh, even the new democratic bill has lots of things in it that uh, benefit the rich. So it, it, it's difficult to get these things passed. Um, and uh, on the, on the bottom side, I, I think there's uh, a, a lot to do, a lot we can do. And um, certainly the whole field of behavioral economic development, um, Esther Duflo and her colleagues who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, uh, they and their collaborators have pioneered that. And I think that there's a lot of similar things that need to be done domestically. And, uh, but there, there are, there's nothing simple like automatic enrollment. There's no switch we can turn that is going to deal with inequality. Yeah. And, um, we, we kind of know the directions we'd have to go, but I don't have an easy answer. Yeah. All right. Here's a, here's a, I think the final question and uh, thinking along the lines of your Lakeshore drive and Oak street uh, example, which is great example. Maybe you can describe it to the, to the audience uh, quickly. And the, what the question is asking for an example of that was a case where you had behavioral clues that help people slow down. What about the opposite problem of trying to get people to speed up? So maybe like for vaccinations or climate change or other yeah. things where there's something urgent and you want people to believe that it's urgent engaging these things. So maybe why don't you describe the Lakeshore Drive example? Okay, so yeah, let's, so the Lakeshore Drive is, a, if you've never been to Chicago, you should go. It's a beautiful city that People don't realize how beautiful it is. Um, and there's a road that goes along the lakeshore 
all the way from the University of Chicago almost up to uh, Northwestern. And, um, and uh, there's one point um, where there's a very dangerous curve. And people wipe out there all the time. And what they did is they painted lines, horizontal lines across the road, that as you're approaching the apex of this curve, the lines start getting closer and closer together. That gives you the illusion that you are speeding up and you reflexively tap the brake and slow down. And it's a brilliant, it wasn't our idea, but uh, I noticed it. That's on my commute in Chicago. And I thought it was a great idea. And the city tells us the accident rate did fall, although it, not to zero. Um, so uh, it, it's a great nudge. Um, the nudging was useful in vaccine take up for a while. I think we've been in three stages. The first stage, when the vaccine first came available, and it, it, there was excess demand. We didn't have to nudge people. And uh, it was all a question of, could you find a place that was uh, had shots available? Then there was a middle phase where nudging was helping, make it easy, take the vaccines to the people, free beers, um, uh, because there were people who were just procrastinating or were hesitant. Um, then... I think we got to a place maybe around May, June, where we reached the people who had strong opinions, largely misinformed, uh, according to all the scientists, and I share that view. And um, nudging wasn't really working. I have advocated for mandates, not necessarily issued by the government. Um, I don't know what, uh, well, at the University of Chicago and many other universities, every student and every faculty member, every employee had to be vaccinated before classes started. And I think that's an, a perfectly appropriate thing to do. The uh, National Basketball Association and National Football League have not quite mandated the vaccine, but they make life very difficult if you're unvaccinated. And if you're unvaccinated and get a positive COVID test, you're in quarantine for two weeks. And strict rules when you're on road trips. So this isn't, this is beyond nudging, but uh, I think completely appropriate. So one of the themes of the new final edition of Nudge is that Nudge is not the answer to every problem. It can help any problem, but it's not the answer we have completely rewrote the chapter on climate change. Um, and the way we start is agreeing with 99% of the economics profession that the first step in dealing with climate change is carbon pricing. And we're not going to get there until we do that. And it's very frustrating that there's an alliance between progressives on the green side who don't like carbon pricing because they think the price would be too low and conservatives 
who just don't like taxes. And that coalition has kept the price of carbon uh, as zero uh, federally. California has a cap and trade system, um, but uh, federal level doesn't. And I think that's too bad. Now, there are things we can do, and there are successful nudges. You know, you now, you, when you get your, um, your energy bill, it will tell you how much can, energy you're using compared to your neighbors. That reduces usage by two or three percent. And you might say, well, you know, that's not a big effect. Uh, that's true, but it's also free, right? They're sending you the bill. It doesn't cost anything more to include that little bit of information. And as we quote President Obama, who used to say in such settings, better is good. Yeah. So, you know, better is good. So, so we should keep nudging where we can and if it's two or three percent improvements, those are good. But if we're dealing with a crisis like COVID or like climate change, we need sterner things like taxes and regulations. And, you know, fraud, we don't just nudge. We, we throw people in jail. Yeah. Uh, same with violent crime. We, we, we need sterner things for big issues, but nudging can still help. That's a great note to end with. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thanks to the audience for your questions. And it's been great to have you here. Thanks, Al. This is third time we've done this. And um, I said that uh, I, I'm in your debt. Uh, I hope to see you soon. And first drinks on me. Ah, oh, that's a good nudge. <laughs> Thanks.